Welcome to Here She Stands, the podcast where Lutheran women from across Australia come together as a community, sharing stories and testifying to God's goodness. We do this so when the tribulations of this world try to push us down, each woman can hold firm to the word of God and confidently say, here I stand, I can do no other. My name is Lexi and I am a homeschooling mama of four girls and the wife of a first year pastoral student. I love theology books, classical music, and I'm currently trying my hand at becoming more self-sufficient. And I'm Sonia, a Lutheran pastor's wife, homeschooling mum of two kiddos, homemaker, tradition lover, and all-round crafty person. In today's episode, we will be talking with Georgie Grieger. Georgie will be sharing a little bit about herself and also discussing the topics of art and beauty in the church. Actually, symbolism and beauty in the church is something I'd never thought much about until a few months ago when my husband and I actually had some conversations about this, about how undervalued and underappreciated and sometimes even overlooked art in the church can be. So hello, Georgie. It's so lovely to have you on the podcast today. Well, thank you for having me. So Georgie, let's begin by just finding a little bit about yourself. Where do you live? Are you married? Things like that. So please introduce yourself. So I'm Georgie. I'm based in regional Queensland. I grew up in Harvey Bay. And since I have, I am married uh, two years now. And since then, I've moved to the Gympie region. We live sort of in the countryside a little. We have one little tyke. (laughs) Um, I wasn't exactly brought up in the church, but I was exposed to Christian uh, education, uh, interestingly, through the state school system. We had RE, um, though I wasn't attending church. So it wasn't until I was about in high school that I sort of became a, a lot more focused on faith and Christ. I attended two private schools, Christian schools, and then when I was in university, I then started attending a Lutheran church then. So definitely my husband and I are Lutheran um, and that's the circle we're in now. So yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell. Okay. And what drew you to the Lutheran church? Was it just the church around the corner where you were or was there something specific that made you attend a Lutheran church? So I wasn't Woomba at the time and there's nearly a Lutheran church around every corner there. So (laughs) that might have been part of it. But I... To briefly put it, I did do a lot of study into lots of different denominations. Like I wasn't brought up in the church and even though I was familiar with some practices, I hadn't really called any home yet. And I also was analysing and wanting to know what the differences were and why the differences were. So there was a lot of historical stuff I sort of looked into as well. And I had numerous Christian friends in person and online and one of my American friends actually started attending a Lutheran church and what, what was called, called confirmation and I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> anyway, they redirected me to the Book of Concord and so I started reading through that and I went, wow, this makes a lot of sense and at that point I had read quite a few sort of what they call sort of statements of faith from other churches. Some other older traditions of churches didn't necessarily have as much of, a, of an extension of beliefs. Oh, what, am I, what do I mean by that? The the Lutherans are very thorough. <laughs> yes. And so I definitely knew I, I wasn't Roman Catholic for various theological reasons, but the Lutherans were sort of the next bet from there. And so I had a Lutheran church five minutes away from me. And so that, and then I just took myself off there and I got catechized and yeah. I love that you started with the Book of Concord. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, my friend was had just gone through catechesis and so that's obviously what they were given so he's like he's like you got to go read that and then it makes sense from there (laughs) that's amazing yeah so your choice to go to a Lutheran church it wasn't just jumping in to see what it was like there was research yeah I had I don't know where I'm from there's a lot of Baptists a lot of Pentecostals like as you probably experience a lot of the sort of older tradition of churches they mm. seem to be sort of shrinking and the, and the the more protestant charismatic groups are thriving and so throughout high school I had a, a lot more of a pentecostal influence 
around me, but not necessarily in my theology, if that makes sense. So yeah, it was, I already had a fair bit of exposure in university. I was praying for fellowship. And so, you know, I was doing Bible study with people who are slightly different from me, but, you know, I still learned a lot from them and we, you know, they still taught me a lot of things in the Bible. And so I think it was just sort of this, it was kind of, it was a very organic process, like <laughs> it all just sort of fell into yeah um, it, it, it was def I'm definitely Lutheran on purpose um that wasn't I didn't just yeah rock up to church one day it was very and at the time I was witnessing a lot of Calvinists online and so I would bring things up with my pastor at the time and you know he'd talk me through the Lutheran perspective and that was really good having someone to sort of nut out certain ideas with I haven't turned back like at no point have I really questioned anything with what I believe so yeah that's um, really beautiful and I really like your term Lutheran on purpose <laughs> that's a really good way of putting it um neither Sonia or I were born into the Lutheran church so I suppose in a way we could be Lutherans on purpose too I like and that. it's such a beautiful secure place to be let's jump into the topic of today's episode which is art and beauty in the church so from my understanding you have studied art yes so can you tell us a little bit about that like where did you study and what type of art did you study so in Toowoomba at the university there they have a quite a large creative arts school there and technically what I've studied is contemporary art and um, that is very broad <laughs> yes. um, I know there's lots of different interpretations on what contemporary art is or what it could be I will say the experience I had, the education I had, was fairly individualistic. It wasn't concrete in any particular kind of thought. Culturally, I think sometimes the church can be a bit oh, hesitant to contemporary art because there's quite a division between the art and the church. And I get that. And definitely in North America, I've met artists who've shared their experiences at, as a Christian contemporary art schools can be very conflicting either just in what they're being taught or how they're being treated even thankfully I did not have that experience at all at my mm -hmm. art school I think probably because of the fact it's in Toowoomba there's like over 100 churches in Toowoomba <laughs> mm -hmm. at least uh, church groups and I think nearly every year there's Christians coming through that school and so it was not a bad experience so I, I when we say contemporary art typically that means art of today but what we studied was uh, the modern era, so last early last century up until today. That's what we studied. I don't have a great depth of knowledge on art prior to then. Um, however, mm -hmm. I've kind of been making that my personal mission over the years just to try to learn about Reformation art or medieval art or Baroque art or whatever, yeah, as my personal hobby. But, yeah. Mm. Yeah. From my understanding, you've also worked in a gallery as well. I've done volunteer experience working in galleries. That being said, though, it was quite complex work. So some of it was installation art, some of it sometimes curating. Um, I did work for a council gallery at one point, volunteering, and then I then also assisted in a private gallery too where I also did some further curating and exhibiting myself as well. Yes, and I've also been an art teacher. Okay, that's mm -hmm. awesome. And tell us a little bit about your own works that were exhibited. So the works I've exhibited in recent times has been more religious, but or probably what you more so call in a contemporary art world as spiritual. Yeah, that's just a semantics thing because yeah. some, some of my work is more abstract and so it's not literal and clear-cut. I have done lots of paintings. That's probably predominantly what's been displayed. I have done some printmaking as well. I do some drawings, but it's been predominantly paintings that I've created. Uh, since my last year of university, that's where I really started to hone in on religious topics within my work. Before mm. then, I did a lot of stuff about nature and music, but I found that was starting to fall flat. And I'm like, well, I'm interested in this theology thing, so let's try and intertwine that into my art more. And I just found this depth of history and imagery that you don't really see much in regional Queensland. And I'm like, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And nothing stopped me. And so, like, I was sort of expecting the whole, you know, typical backlash, oh, this is a religious thing or whatever. But no, I still yet to experience that. So I've, that was pretty, yeah. So I have some varying artworks. I would say predominantly spiritual artworks, but some of it's a bit more 
just every day. <laughs> yep. Would you say that you coming into the church and starting to dig into theology and reading things like the Book of Concord started to move you from, like you said, drawing nature and different things like that into the religious side of art? Definitely a portion of it definitely is. Yeah. I, I remember particularly a sermon well, I don't exactly remember the sermon. I think it was on Revelation. <laughs> but my pastor had actually used etchings um, from an artist that's quite well known, Albert Durer, and he has a whole set of etchings. And he's he's in, from that medieval. He had, has several etchings for nearly each chapter in the book of revelation and he was used and my pastor was using them in his sermon as visual aids and i went whoa that's really cool so that was definitely a point where i started to go oh reformation arts a thing like i do i wasn't really aware of that until that point so props to my pastor from then <laughs> and then i i definitely get more intrigued in cultural things and so i was like oh, what's what's the culture of this church and like mm -hmm. where is it coming from where is it going to my other interest is politics and kind of psychology and yeah cultural identity and so i was thinking a lot about how even not in the church people are losing their traditions and yes. people and also like that divide between the church and contemporary art. Why is there this hesitation between those two groups? Like what has gone missing? Why do we not share the same visual language anymore? What is that language meant to be saying or what should it be saying or is it there at all? And so I just I just went down this rabbit hole <laughs> of what I call visual language, which is a broader term. Like it's it's not necessarily paintings. It can be all sorts of things. It could be the carpentry on the pews. It could be the architecture. It could be the stained glass windows. It could be the vestments. It's very broad, right? And what do, how were they used in the past? And so how can they be used now? And so I just kind of went down this. I started borrowing jurors, some of his imagery in my work. Um, yeah. As back then, because there was this big upheaval in change of style during the Reformation period, like the Renaissance was happening at the same time. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm going to fast forward some history here, but if there was like a kind of classic movements happening at this Reformation period. And so there was lots of art being destroyed, but there was this kind of weird positive light to it in that this new kind of art was uh, the Renaissance was actually sort of people were more accepting to it. Anyway, Dura was very unique in the way that he approached the Renaissance style. Anyway, so long story short, people actually would borrow his etchings and turn them into stained glass window designs. And I was reading this book on stained glass and I came across that. And so I'm like, well, what if I, well, like, I'm, I want to make some Lutheran art. What if I just full on take this Reformation art and borrow it in my own work? And so I was sort of experimenting with just recycling old images yeah. uh, from that period. And then from there on, I sort of, try to uh, establish more of an art trail of Lutheran artists to see who else I could look at and be inspired from. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Just going back to something you said before about this disconnection between the church and contemporary art, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? What do you think has, I suppose you could say, gone wrong? Why do you think there is this, you know, a bit of a disconnection? So... Definitely, uh, in my head, I theorise there's two main parts. Like there's probably several factors, but there's two main ones. The first one being a kind of chasm in the church, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is a kind of chasm? A kind of chasm is where groups of people have a belief that certain images are not for edification. In fact, they might even be blasphemous or idolatry. And yeah. so what they do is they start to reduce that more and more to the point where it doesn't really exist anymore. So to give an example, you might come across some Protestant churches where they have no images of God, mm, but yeah. they will have a cross. <laughs> yes. And Those there are some, yeah, sorry, were you going to say there were some churches that don't even use crosses? Yeah, the Dutch Reform don't have crosses. Um, mm, and wow. I think possibly, I don't know if there's any churches anymore that fall in the line of Zwingli, but he was another proponent at the time of the Reformation, and he was quite iconoclastic as well. Uh, that's that's sort of the extreme of it. And so we look at we look at the Reformation, and there's 
rifts and growths and spasms. And I think one of the biggest rifts that happened was removing images. And, and, and people started to, well, not necessarily so, but depending on the denomination, a Traven church building started to become less beautiful and less purposeful in its imagery. There were definitely still some wonderful cathedrals built, say, in the Roman Catholic denominations, Anglican and all that. But even if you look at the Anglican church today, it's so void of yeah. any beauty. Like there's two Anglican churches in town here. And one of them is considered low church. The other one's considered high church. So the high church is meant to be more classical and the low church is more reformed. That's the general understanding. But even the high church, <laughs> I mean, kudos to them to do have some artwork. Um, and they've got some, they've got a wonderful big altar, but it's very minimal in its design. And like, I know money is a big factor for us today, but even that doesn't have much beauty in it. Like there's a little bit, they've tried, but because it's been centuries of just getting rid of those things that point back towards God. Anyway, so that's the first point. The second point is the like non-religious. So quite literally the non-religious people with modernistic philosophies who don't even see reality. Hmm. They have this very subjective approach and they go, well, these objects don't have exist. God doesn't exist. Beauty doesn't exist. It's all just a figment of, of our imagination or something like that, right? Or it's all semantics or something. And so they stop caring about details because to them it's all about function. Yeah. And so that's where you come across a lot of our sort of modern buildings today, religious or not, it's all just about is it functional? Yeah. Um, True. And so... Okay, so like you, you spiral down to today's and we we don't have people who build cathedrals in Australia. We don't have architects that are familiar with designing churches. You know, they don't know to put in a cry room. They don't know to put in a vestry, that are, you know. And so the only way you can get some good funding is if this architect is in a competition. And so for him to or her to get some kind of money out of their potentially win an award in this competition, they've got to make it look new and exciting and not like something old yeah. you know um and so it's just this massive mentality shift through religiously speaking and just culturally speaking and there yeah, now that it's like a resource game and a money game and yeah i think my my mission is to try to like inspire people just to just to consider the small things like just you don't have to build a cathedral overnight but it's like how can we point get have these things point people back to these things so they they know how to use them so that that can be pointed back to god um and so beauty in the church visually is yeah it's you know the word gothic yeah it means it means to look upward hmm, really and so gothic churches are he quite literally heavenly they are meant to yeah. point towards the heavens it's this meeting place between heaven, like heaven and earth jesus comes down into the sacrament so that we can consume it like it, like we we should <laughs> it should feel like we're about to take that heavenly thing, but we have sheds and buildings that look like bunkers, mm. and we wonder why people forget to read God's word. <laughs> yeah, something yeah. that we talked about, my husband and I, is there's quite a few really beautiful ornate Lutheran churches in the Barossa. Oh sure, um, and a lot of the people that built these churches in the towns that live there they made some of the artwork and the ornate woodwork and the stained glass windows and that themselves and it's um I don't know I just feel like it would be so making something to beautify and edify God's building would just give you a little bit of ownership in the whole thing as well yeah, you feel personally connected to it. Yeah, you would yeah. feel connected to the building and to the place and feel like you've contributed somehow and given of your gifts and your talents, whereas if we just say those gifts and those talents are nothing and don't matter in the church, then mm. I feel like we're taking that away from people mm. to be able to be in the church and use these gifts mm. in that way. There's definitely, I've seen a small trend where online, like in articles and such, where people are trying to encourage the rest of the church to try to, like, notice who your creative people are mm. and try to use them for the church. 
So yeah. visual arts, musically, whatever, because there's been such a disconnect, culturally speaking. You, and people are often shy too. Like they, they like, you know, we're <laughs> God calls us to be humble. They're not exactly going to toot their own horn. But if you notice that they're, they're good at something, go, hey, maybe we can, you can contribute to that sort of thing. There needs to be encouragement there. But I think, you know, we're dealing with in a time where there is a lot of creative, a lot of the creative how do we call it industries riddled with certain philosophies that don't align with our christian beliefs and yeah. so i think that's where it's really hard for some people who maybe they recognize someone's creative but they're a little bit apprehensive because they don't want a certain philosophy to infiltrate the church and so it's like that's where i'm i'm interested in trying to sort of encourage that balance where you can have something that's kind of new and very creative but it still lines up with what we believe in you know and it's not going to be over consumed by certain agendas yes so as christians we shouldn't run away we shouldn't run away just because art or whatever it is has been used or is attached to a philosophy that's not in line with scripture we shouldn't run away from that Mm. But we should continue to take that art or to take whatever it is and do it for the glory of God and do it to edify the church and to point people to Christ. Mm. Because at the end of the day, our creator, our God is the one who invented art. He is the <laughs> one who invented beauty. Mm. It rightfully belongs to him. And mm. just read through the passages that describe what the tabernacle looked like or what the temple looked like and there was gold and the carvings and the different colored curtains and the different pieces that they would use in the temple it's stunning it sounds absolutely beautiful and that's what god instructed them to do that's mm. how he instructed them to create this place of worship mm. And um, I really like your attitude of not running away, just just using it for the glory of God. Mm. Mm. It does give me joy. You know, I, I'm stuck here in Queensland. There are there are some sort of more older churches, sort of Brisbane-ish. I know that there's probably some more beautiful churches down in the south because you know, they were built by the earlier Lutherans in Australia and they were bringing those traditions with them. Yep. Um, so... The fact that we still have some standing in Australia and they're still in use, they serve a big purpose now. <laughs> um, yeah. lot, lots of writing this poor, like, old church. It's 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 got a responsibility now to be an example for <laughs> newer, newer church buildings. But, mm. yeah, it's the difference it makes, though, having a place where you can clearly tell the people gave thought that this is a sanctified and set-apart place. Um, yes. It's, it's theology because theology is doctrine and practice. And I think this is where Christians in general, doesn't mean Lutherans, Christians in general forget this. Like we might think of practice as in praying and reading our Bible, but it's it's doing stuff and making stuff. And, you yes. know, it's part of our theology to practice having things set apart for God. And if your worship space, and I'm talking a lot about church buildings here, but it, it can be other creative outlets too, like music and all that. If it looks like the world, then something's probably gone wrong. Yeah. Like I'm not saying everyone should have a cathedral. There's even some small timber chapels that, you know, they don't look like any other kind of building and they're not as, well, maybe timber chapels are expensive today, but if you were to replicate a chapel like that, it doesn't look like any other religion's temple. And I think we're at a point in time where people can't discern that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's a good point. And I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong, but it's just not helpful. And so yes. if we can try to enhance and beautify things where we can, then our whole spiritual experience will be way more edifying. Yes. So you're not saying that, you know, if you don't have a cathedral to worship in with incredible paintings that look like they're from the Renaissance and, and pews that have carved whatever on them, um, you're not saying that you have to have that in order to have a wonderful worship um, oh, no. of God. You're saying that, hey, we worship God, so let's worship God with what we have, with um, our space. Let's make it reverent towards him and let's make it glorifying towards him. Let's beautify it because he is a God of beauty. I love that word reverent. That's exactly what it is. I remember 
talking to uh, some pastors uh, with friends of mine about orders of service because that's a very political thing in the church. You know, like every yeah. this so many Lutheran churches have a different way of doing things. So we're all, you know, arguing this point, and like the pastor said, similar to you, it's like it it doesn't make one any less valuable than the other. However, there is there will always be a, a better order of doing things. So if you have been given the knowledge of how to do things better, you should maybe try and do things better. Um, yes. So it doesn't mean that someone who doesn't know as much is doing anything wrong. It's just, yeah, if we can attempt to be more reverent, we should. Yes. You briefly touched on not bringing philosophies that we don't agree with in and the word reverent and that kind of thing. Do you think there are artworks that we shouldn't bring in or should avoid or that we things that we have in our church that we should maybe take out? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I've mentioned architecture and I think it's we're just sort of in a we're in limbo regarding that because like nobody really designs and builds cathedrals in Australia. Well, maybe there is, but there would be only be only a couple people. And so, you know, when it comes to that, we can't just say, oh, get rid of all the bad churches. Like, no, these are these are the worship places. They have been consecrated. You know, they've got older places. But yeah, when it comes to artworks, well, I think any introduction of artwork would be pretty good. I know some churches, are, there are some congregations who are fairly diligent to trying to keep creative things. And even if it's just at Easter time or Christmas, you know, they try to do something for it. I, I encourage that. I haven't really personally, personally, in my experience, seen anything bad in our church in our church spaces our worship spaces regarding art at this point i would encourage nearly anything but when it comes to sort of certain philosophies i think it's more so does this point back to god's word if it doesn't or if it's vague then it probably shouldn't you might consider it maybe a devotional artwork for yourself like if you created something you go well i was thinking this at the time but it's not explicitly conveyed that's perfectly fine but that would be probably more suited outside of the worship area. So whilst I'm on this topic, I come across an article by a, uh, a retired professor, but I think she's still a teacher sometimes. She's from Norway, and I think she's Roman Catholic. And she has four terms for art in the church. So she has sacred art, and that's, that's more attributed to, say, Catholic and Eastern Orthodox groups, mystical groups where they have mysticism attached to their icons and things like yes. that but as lutherans we could probably consider sacred art like you know the altar table itself or maybe a crucifix maybe some icons we don't have the same mysticism but it's like these mm -hmm. are set apart they have particular roles yeah. and then you've got liturgical art and liturgical art is everything relating to the liturgy mm -hmm. so it can be vestments paraments anything particular to the calendar season You've got ecclesial art. And so that's kind of like every other kind of Christian religious art, which it can be sacred, it can be liturgical, but it might not be specific to those categories. So it might be, you know, an image of Jesus with the little children, but it's like a modern adaptation or something like that. And then you've got contemporary art. So your Christian spiritual ideas can still be present, but they're not explicit. And it's not yes. necessarily for the edification of the church. It might be used for evangelism. It might be just used in your own personal therapeutic kind of art making. I am thinking more in terms of visual art, but there are, there are, uh, these can be designated to music and architecture and all those other things as well. Yeah. And so, you know, when it comes to contemporary art, it's, it's best to, if we're talking about the worship space, it's best to just keep things uh, as orderly as possible. So as soon as there's some kind of personal influence or, and I'm not talking about artistic license, but what I mean is like, is, is this about you? <laughs> is this about God? Like yes. as soon as the artwork starts to become about you or it's a philosophy that's not Christian or a political thing, or like, you know, as soon as it gets to that point, it needs to come out of the worship space. You can hang it wherever else you like, put it in your own exhibition, hang it in the foyer if you want, you know, yes. as long as it's not in, this is not art for sort of sacred devotional, you know, things that are going to help everyone. Yeah. So in the worship space, stick to art that is very close. Sorry, what am I trying to say? It relates to what is being practised. Yes. God has revealed himself in scripture in a very specific way. 
So make sure your art is in line with how he has revealed himself in yeah, scripture. Yeah, but it needs to be explicit. Like we do have symbols and, you know, over time we learn what those symbols mean. So sometimes things aren't necessarily explicit. Like we might look at a, a fleur and you think, oh, that's just a pretty decal of something. But really it is it is a symbol for the Trinity. There's lots of symbols for the Trinity, but that's one of the, So maybe, you know, sometimes things are a little bit vague, but I'm talking more about, because in contemporary art, a lot of artists just do their own thing now. So every artist's independent visual language, you have to like learn that artist's language. Like there's no cohesive language anymore in our current art world. So when you want to introduce something more abstract, more ambiguous, you got to get your whole congregation on board to, so that they can actually learn about God's word through that artwork. Um, if it's way too ambiguous that they can't, it's it's more of a distraction and less less orderly. It's not good. It's kind of like everyone speaking at tongues at the same time. Like, no, you got to keep things structured. So yeah, like we could go on and have another discussion about about certain philosophies that are present in contemporary art. But I think if that might be another discussion. <laughs> So, Georgie, could you please tell us who are some of the artists from the Reformation period that are worth looking into? When I was starting to look into this stuff when I was in university, I noticed there weren't a lot of contemporary artists that were Lutheran to draw from, so I thought I'd just jump straight back into the Reformation at the time. So the probably the most notable one is Lucas Cranach, and there's actually two men with that name, so there's the father and the son, but the father, the elder, he was actually best friends with Martin Luther and mm-hmm. he was the one witness to Martin Luther's marriage. So he's probably the most notable when it comes to, say, Lutheran Reformation art. Um, the one that I take most inspiration from is Albert Dürer, and I mentioned him earlier. He's actually He was actually technically Roman Catholic, but he was sympathetic towards Luther and because he had training in the Renaissance, his artworks were very, they were well liked across different church groups. There's a few smaller ones that have sort of been coming to light later in history. They maybe not have been very prominent at the time. But one of the ones that were later discovered that I like is Matthias Grunewald. I'm not sure if he's Lutheran. He was mentioned actually by Melanchthon in one of, one of his writings. And surprisingly, both Dürer and Grunewald they only died about 11 years after the Reformation, after 1517. So mm-hmm. they, even though some of their works are really well loved today, they weren't around for long, you know. Uh, Lucas Cranach, he, the, the elder, he lived until later, until 1553, and both he and his son did religious work. Lucas Cranach, the younger, he would reproduce some of his dad's work but also make his own, and he only died in 1586. So they're sort of the three I look to. In regards to contemporary artists, there's a few. I've got. A, I've been trying to work a database for Lutheran artists internationally because I stumbled upon being in charge of a Facebook group and I thought, well, I kind of want to make a resource out of this group. And so mm. I started building this database. So, but there's lots of names I could mention. There's two I will mention and they're both North American artists. They're in different synods. One is Edward Rehoyas. Riho- He's an experienced commercial artist, actually, but I think he's technically retired. But in his retirement, he's actually honing in on more liturgical and ecclesial art. Yeah. Um, and he does have a blog, which is the Art Commudgeon, which they're quite easy to read. Those blog posts are not long and intensive. The other person I recommend who's more contemporary, a Lutheran artist, is Jonathan Mayer. And it's possible people have seen his artworks around the place, not realise they're his, because he's done some illustrations for children's books too, I think. But he does really good realistic stuff. Like he's yeah. one of those painters. And I think he's actually currently working with a stained glass company from memory. So his, his website's called The Scapegoat Studio, and his blogs are very good. If you want something intensive, something that's very analytical, but he's thoroughly looking into religious art, Lutheran art, all that sort of thing. He's really good for that. So those are the artists that I, that's where I get my sort of immediate Lutheran influence from. Yeah. Thank you for that. And where can we actually find out more? We will actually link a lot of this in the show notes for our listeners who are wanting to look into these artists. Mm. So what can you give our listeners to say, this is where you can go to see Lutheran art, to learn more and to also connect with other people who are interested in 
Lutheran so we, art. So we have a Facebook group, which is called Lutheran and Religious Art. Uh, it's a public group, so you can see the posts in there. And oh, people share their own things. They share pictures of other things they like. It's not necessarily Lutheran, but people share music, architecture, artworks from varying cultures and ages within the church. So that's that's a very social platform if you're interested in that in regards to say studying the topics more there's some books i say books there's some resources i've written down here so one of them is a book and it's by gene veef it's called state of the art and he talks a bit about you know you mentioned earlier about you know the building of the temple and you know all the mm. ornate things that god directed them to do so he kind of talks a bit about that how god uses beauty and there's different creative people for different creative roles making beautiful things sacred things consecrating things so that's a book that's probably like the one like lutheran art book we have but that being said there are sort of more authors and pastors writing more about this now like it's kind of it's a small trend yeah so there's a group called justin sinner and they have podcasts that's uh, jordan, jordan cooper jordan cooper so yeah. he's got a few podcasts on beauty in the church and he kind of goes into philosoph philosophical stuff as well um and there's lectures and workshops sometimes you can sign up for some of them are free some of them you pay for but jordan cooper does have a book called in defense of the true the good and the beautiful hmm. uh so that's uh another book we have and then pastor gavin miser he actually has a book called Beauty and Catechesis. I've not read it, but it's supposedly meant to go through the, I imagine, the small catechism, but he puts artwork with it. So if you want to sort of extrapolate <laughs> what we believe uh, with, with visuals, that's what he's done for you. It's kind of like a creative devotional book. So those are some resources I can recommend. Thank you so much for coming on today and talking about Lutheran art and sharing your story into religious art. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Thank you for joining us today on the Here She Stands podcast. We hope that this episode has encouraged your faith. Information and links relating to today's episode can be found in the show notes. Don't forget to check them out. You can find Here She Stands on Facebook and Instagram or you can email us at hereshestands.podcast at gmail.com. If you would like to subscribe to our newsletter, please go to our website at hereshestands.online and fill in the subscription form. This way we can keep you updated with the latest news and also send you links to new episodes as they are released. If you haven't already done so, please check out the incredible episode we did with Claire Kleinig. Claire is married to Lutheran author, scholar, and emeritus professor of exegetical theology, Dr. John Kleinig. Our next episode will be in two weeks when we sit down and chat with Meg Pierce. Meg lives in Adelaide and is married to a Lutheran minister. She will be sharing her story and talking about the joys and challenges of caring for dying loved ones. Until then, we pray that you will hold fast to the word of God and confidently say, here I stand, I can do no other.